Hey, deserving listeners, a lot of you have asked that I continue watching Smothered and react to it. This is season one, episode one. Last time I did Cher and Dawn, and today I think we're going to see Angelica and soon he. So let's get to it. My name is Dr. Karkanda. I'm a therapist and a professor. Let's see if anything of interest comes out of my face as I watch the show. Hey, Mom, how's it going? It's nice and hot in here. The way I feel about my daughter, she is the very essence of who I am as a mother. She's just a precious little diamond to me. So as I did with Cher and Don, I'm gonna do the same with Angelica and Soon He. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, Soon He. Uh, Sun He, I'm not quite sure, I, we'll, we'll find out. But uh, in, with Cher and Don, I gave them the benefit of the doubt until I heard otherwise. Uh, just because something looks strange or it's played up to be strange on the television doesn't mean that it is pathological. It might be culturally odd to you that a mother and a daughter would be so close, but it's not inherently pathological. There are various different ways in which one can get their needs met. And so let's let's keep an eye out for signs of pathology and signs of non-pathology. So innocent until proven guilty. Let's continue watching. Mornings with my mom are so important because we work so much so we try to make the most of our time. Hey, Angelica. Yeah, mom. Are you ready to get in? I'll be right there. If the water is still hot, we will share the bath water. She'll take a quick bath and then I'll go right after her. She always goes first and I know it makes her happy. When she goes into my bath water after I've bathed, shows me so much trust. Okay. So right away, we have something that is strange for Americans. One, it's weird to take baths in the United States uh, for some people. And it's also strange to share bath water. In Asian countries, I'm half Japanese. Families, particularly in the past, would take baths all together. So not only would they share the water, but they would also share the bath. There are different cultural norms regarding how to bathe and, you know, modesty regarding your bodies. In Western cultures uh, in the United States, we are particularly uptight about bodies, particularly uptight about showering and bathing. I could see a lot of people reacting to this, but, you know, there's nothing pathological about it. It's just a preference. And a bond that is unexplainable. It's, it's amazing. Hmm. My mom is the closest person to me in my life, ever, even after life. She's gonna be the closest person to me. Thank you, baby. So what we're looking for always in these relationships is, is it coercive? Does the child in particular have a choice in the matter? Or has the child been forced to say this sort of thing and to believe it? Are they essentially being coerced or brainwashed into believing that their mother is their best friend. It's possible that mothers could also be coerced in this situation. Usually we're worried about the daughter. So I haven't heard anything yet that indicates pathology in that way, inflexibility or coercion or power or dominance. Can a daughter be very, very close to one's mother? Yes. Can a daughter consider mother to be best friend at the cost of other kinds of relationships? Absolutely. Just because it looks strange doesn't mean it's inherently pathological. What we're always talking about is flexibility. Do the two individuals have the flexibility to get their needs met in other ways? A common litmus test is for the daughter, she wants to have a romantic and sexual relationship with someone. She obviously cannot have that with her mother. Can she have that sort of relationship functionally and still have a good relationship with the mom? Is the relationship flexible enough for that? But it's possible that some adult daughters aren't that interested in a romantic and sexual relationship. But then it raises the question, have they sub, you know, submerged their desire for romance and sex because they are worried that it's gonna threaten their mom? Or is the adult child just naturally not that interested? There are plenty of people who are what we call asexual or demisexual or aromantic or both. Some people just really aren't into sex and that's okay. Some people just really aren't into romance and some people really aren't into sex and romance. 
When I first saw Angelica, she looked like an angel. I said, she is gonna be my everything. I had to be the strong one for my daughter because she had no father. My first husband, which is Angelica's father, he hasn't been in our lives ever since she was about six months old. Okay, so right away, we get a pretty important detail that the father left the family or something happened and was not there past the time that Angelica was six months old. So this is the, a recipe for enmeshment and dominance and coercion for a child. Uh, I, we don't know, maybe there are other siblings, maybe the mom had other kinds of relationships. So what sometimes will happen is the, the mother will have a child, the father will leave the family. The mother is now overwhelmed with parenting. She's a single mother, she's probably working, and she's very stressed out. She doesn't have time for friends, she doesn't have time for romance, and so uh, all of her life is spent working and being a mom. But you have all these other needs. You have needs to parent well. You have needs to have attention from your own child. You have needs to do well at work. But you also have attachment needs, romantic needs, sexual needs. So as those needs emerge in the mom, where do those needs go? You're trying to have those needs met. You try to clamp down on them. You try to say, well, I need to put aside my romantic needs for later because I'm not going to get that. I need to put down my friendship needs for later because I don't have time for that right now but it crops up. You need somebody and you might turn to your own child for those needs to be met. You might turn to your child for friendship. You might turn to your child for pseudo romantic companionship, the sort of enmeshment that you feel when you're infatuatedly in love with somebody. It might not be in such incestuous or sexually abusive, but it'll definitely feed, you're definitely trying to get that really you know, close, mutually uh, loving relationship that you typically can have those needs met with your spouse or in a romantic relationship. And so when the mother is depending on the child for those needs to be met and there's no other siblings, there's no other adults, the mother can lose perspective and thus only rely on the child for those needs to be met. Also, this insular relationship can create a barrier to change. Uh, for example, say Angelica is 12 years old and the mother is like, okay, time to start dating. And she goes on a, she finds someone to go on a date with. She you know, goes on a date. And this creates tremendous anxiety for both mother and child. Mother is anxious because she is pulling away from her, her one and only best friend, her, 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 her most favorite human that she depends on. And the 12-year-old hasn't been allowed to differentiate, so she's terrified when the mother leaves. And the two of them might sabotage the situation in a variety of ways to make sure that this other relationship does not succeed, thereby returning the mother and the daughter back to the enmeshment. So I'm not seeing anything along those lines yet, but we certainly have a fertile ground for that sort of relationship in a single parent, single child situation. Let's continue watching. I have to step up in the absence of him not being in her life to be her father as well as her mother, her sister, her friend. I couldn't picture my life without her. I don't know where I'd be, who I'd be as a person, if it wasn't for her. Okay, the other factor that we can see is it appears as though Angelica is half black and I believe half Korean. And that can create problems for a young girl. She might be ostracized in her community, she might not be but that can sometimes create more reasons for insularity between, is that a word, insularity? Isolation between mother and child, that the child is having trouble with being treated unfairly in her friend group at school, and she continues to return to mother as a safe place, which furthers the enmeshment. Now, enmeshment, I've talked about this before, can be confused for closeness sometimes and closeness can be uh, confused for enmeshment. Closeness in relationships is good and very close in on the average, you know, average wise they're they're closer than average, but there's flexibility. 
each person, given different situations, are free to say, you know what, I want separation, or you know what, I don't want to hear about that, or you know what, I'm going to keep a secret from you because in this instance, I want to. Or you know what, I want to be in a relationship with this other person and at the sacrifice of my time with you. So that's closeness with flexibility. Enmeshment is, is closeness without flexibility, meaning that neither one of the individuals have the flexibility to recognize their own needs or recognize the needs of the other person and adjust to the situation in a way that is optimal for each person's needs. Anyway, let's continue watching. It's beautiful. You ready? Yes, I am. What are you gonna do for me today? Uh, I'm gonna touch up your toes right here. We've always lived together. I have never lived with anybody else. I could be without a man if I have her. I'd be completely happy just with Angelica with me. So again, there's nothing wrong with that. It depends on each person's internal experience does the mother feel limited because of her enmeshment or because she believes she needs to be there for her child and she sacrifices her romantic needs? Or is she just like, you know what, uh, me and my daughter, we have a wonderful relationship and yeah, I, I'll take romance, but no, nah, I don't need it. The other, there's a lot of things that come to mind regarding this. Other kinds of factors that can lead to that enmeshment can be sometimes single mothers, single parents will, will feel very guilty about not having the other parent around. Sometimes you know, a single mother might feel like ashamed that they weren't able to hold on to the father or ashamed that they chose to have a baby with a, a man who was not a good person. And they feel like they have to make up for the fact that there isn't a father around and they feel bad about that. And one of the ways that they might try to make up for that, to overcompensate for it, is to be all things to that child. Not only mother, but also father, also best friend, also all these things. And it can create a lot of pressure for the parent to, to be all things. The other thing that along these lines that can happen is the child can feel guilty for kind of ruining the mother's life. Uh, or they might feel guilty for being half of their father, which can, again, suppress their own needs and cause them to give themselves over to the mother as a sign of penitence or that sort of thing. Anyway, let's continue watching. I need a man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for obvious reasons. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we heard our very first indication that the daughter has needs for romance and or sex and they're both able to laugh about it. And in this instance, anyway, they don't seem threatened. But anyway, who knows what'll happen on the rest of the season. Let's continue watching. She is the love of my life. You are the love of my life. If I could find a man version of Angelica, I would marry them in a heartbeat. Can you talk to okay, that's an odd way of putting things, but nothing pathological. We saw that little interaction where the mother was saying something very, uh, I don't know, connecting to the daughter and the daughter was like, okay, and didn't reciprocate. So how do they navigate that? Are, is the daughter able to find and explore other relationships in a way that is allowed for it? Does, or will the mother punish that by either uh, moving in and, and, and engulfing her or withdrawing her love from the daughter, making the daughter feel bad for those kinds of things. A little bit of that would be expected given how close they are. But past a certain point of excessiveness to the point where the daughter uh, either has to make a choice between uh, exploration of romance or being with mom um, or having to completely forego that. Anyway, let's continue watching. The Brett today? Uh, you know, actually, I did. I do have a fiancé. Brett lives in Omaha, Nebraska. I am satisfied with the long distance. I like living with Angelica, and I don't want to leave her. Ever. Okay, so the mom does have a romantic relationship with someone, and it's long distance. And the mom is saying she doesn't want to leave her daughter. I wonder what that means exactly. Is that saying that she has to make that choice, that in order to be with her romantic partner, 
she has to move to another town and thus away from the daughter. Maybe we'll find out some more. Where are you planning to go? I think he's taking me go-kart racing. Jason's my boyfriend. We've been together for almost two years. We're very, very compatible. He gets me 100%. He understands the need that I have for my mom. She needs to be there. And so he'll include her in our dates. So she's riding in the back while we're in the front. And uh, we, uh, we tow her along. My mom is always first, and Jason knows that. I do make it a point to let her know, hey, I want to see Jason. He knows that my mom can be pretty demanding. Okay, so we got our first indication of pathology that she can, the mother can be demanding. That certainly doesn't sound flexible, right? The daughter also said that, he, she says, so my boyfriend knows that my mom comes before him. Now, if the three of them are willing to live that way, and the daughter and the boyfriend in particular, if they're okay with that, nothing wrong with that. Certainly not a normal way that people live, but not inherently pathological. Uh, I'm guessing we're probably, you know, heading in the direction of gathering more data that the mother is overbearing, but let's continue watching. Thinking it could be him and I. Jason would probably appreciate that time. The happiness that I see with her and Jason, I'm trying very hard to embrace it. But Jason's got too many things that he needs to take care of before I can feel at peace with the relationship. Okay, so there's two messages there that are notable. One is that she said, I'm having a hard time embracing the happiness between my daughter and Jason. So that's interesting. The other thing is she's saying, before I can approve of the relationship, I need to see certain things. Now, in the Western world, and mainstream Seattle culture anyway, it's, it's kind of rare, particularly for an uh, older adult as Angelica. I'm not sure how old she is, maybe, maybe 30 or something. It's, it'd be rare for a mother to feel like she has the right to uh, comment on the adult daughter's relationships in such a strong way. It might be a little bit more common if Angelica was like 18 or something. But other parts of the world, I, and I believe they're Korean, it's much more customary for parents to be very overbearing with their opinions. Now, to me in Seattle, when I look at those kinds of parents who are very overbearing and very uh, negative about their child's dating other people, I don't like that because I come from a culture where parents should step out of the way and, and adult children have the right to date whoever they want to and parents should actually support whatever the decision the child makes unless it's like completely off, you know, uh, off in left field and a terrible decision uh, that's very obvious. So, but that's my culture. Other cultures, in fact, I would estimate most cultures around the world, it's the opposite. For a parent to look the other way and not take control of a child's romantic life would be uh, essentially neglecting your duties as a parent. You would feel like a terrible human being. You would feel like you'd be letting your child down. So I don't know what the mother's uh, culture specifically is in terms of that aspect, but you know, let's keep that in mind as well as we interpret what we're watching. Well, I'm thinking about what I should be doing when you guys go go-karting. You have any ideas what I could do? Mm. Maybe just relax. Okay, so this is interesting. So two, two things here. One is that the mother is basically saying she does not know how to occupy her time when her daughter isn't around. That's notable, right? Uh, the second thing is she's asking her daughter to tell her what she should do when her daughter isn't around. It's also notable, right? So uh, the, f the first thing is like that she has no idea what to do with herself when her daughter isn't around. This points towards a long history of all her life was focused on parenting her daughter at the expense of any other interest in her life. Why would a mother do that? There's, a, there's lots of different reasons. It's possible that the mother has never developed her own sense of who she is independent of other people. She might have been in a difficult family life growing up and she uh, hastily got married and had a child with someone as a way to escape 
her relationship with her parents. You know, her parents are very enmeshed with her. I'm, you know, I'm speculating t completely here. I, but I could see a scenario where her parents definitely don't want her to marry a American person, particularly a black American person, and she marries him, it doesn't or she has a kid with him, it doesn't work out. And then she's maybe even rejected by the family because it's like, see, we told you it was bad. He left you. You're a disgrace on our family and you're kicked out. And now the mother has no one and she can only depend on the daughter. I'm making up a lot of details here, but um, I could see a scenario like that or something along those lines. Uh, but it is very notable that the mother is like, okay, daughter, you're going to spend time with your boyfriend. What am I? I don't know what to do. And daughter, can you please help me figure out what I'm supposed to do with my time alone? It's very notable. I don't want to relax. I get sad when you're not here, so I like to keep myself busy. When she's gone, I literally get physically ill. I get the sweats, I get anxiety, and I want her there. Okay, <laughs> lots of observations with this, this duo. So one, she gets anxious. She actually has a physical anxiety reaction. The other notable thing is the daughter is going, what? <laughs> like either I don't, I didn't know that or that doesn't sound healthy to me. So why would a mother have anxiety like that? Well, lots of different reasons. One, she could be making up those symptoms to, to guilt the daughter into staying close to the mother. That wouldn't be unusual in an enmeshed relationship. Um, you know, parents who are being coercive of children in a mess relationship will sometimes make up physical symptoms or psychological symptoms to suck, to suck the child back in. Uh, they might even use it as a, you know, a guilt trip of just like, so while you were gone all night, I had a complete meltdown or I wanted to kill myself and you weren't here to help me. So it's manipulative. Now, sometimes the person could be so pathological that they'll invent those psychological symptoms and the, and the psychological symptoms will actually uh, become real, uh, psychogenic, if you will, or physical symptoms like stomach ache, this kind of thing. So they could be making it up. They could be using it as a, as a manipulation. It could be generated by their own psychopathology uh, of dependency on their own child. But there's another possibility that she actually legitimately has anxiety symptoms. This is probably more likely, but who knows. And so why would separation from her cause that anxiety? Well, we're, we know that when a child uh, experiences a lot of chaos with regards to their childhood, at the age of five, six, seven years old, sometimes it'll manifest in what we call separation anxiety in that the kid goes to school and is terrified. Mom even just goes to the dentist uh, for a couple hours and child is terrified and just terrified that their mom or dad is gonna die or gonna abandon them or something. And the child is only not anxious when they're in physical proximity to their parent. We call this separation anxiety. And we understand this. This is uh, an understandable condition that children will exhibit when they uh, have difficulties early in life. But it can also happen from parent to child. A parent can have separation anxiety from their own children, particularly if they depend on their adult child for all of their attachment needs. Maybe that's what's going on. Let's continue watching. Why well, I didn't know all that. Okay. Well, next time, hopefully, you guys will invite me. Okay. Sounded a little coercive. All right. Well, hopefully, next time, you'll invite me, right? You know, it's not, doesn't sound very flexible. So, we're definitely starting to see some red flags of pathology. Let's continue watching. It's nice to have you. Oh, well, that looks like it's the end of that duo. So I will end the, the, I'll end the relationship here. <laughs> I'll end the episode here. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments below. Always remember, I have not seen the rest of this season, so I have no idea where this heads. Maybe it goes off the rails. Uh, try not to spoil it too much in the comments because sometimes I read the comments. And everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.